everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Night Show and Share. We do this every single week of the year, except one. Uh, we show off things that we're working on, things that we've made, things that we've totally screwed up to warn other people. Uh, so join us and learn from each other. Uh, first up on our list, we have Thea, who made socks. That's impressive already. It's still that Jackson County one, yeah. All right, a discussion of socks. There are different ways to make socks, top up, top down. I prefer toe up. And this is a traditional toe up cast on. You cast on, there's no seam at the tip of the toe, and then it's a wedge increase. And then when you get to the heel, you increase, and then when you get to the end here, it's short rows to make the curve, and then you just decrease it back to your number of stitches. Wow. <laughs> so, <coughs> my pinky toes, especially since most of these, the only time I wear socks are usually in my safety boots when I'm here in the metalworking area. And my pinky toe doesn't like when the sock wedges up against me. So I saw this pattern on Pinterest and I had to try it. This sock doesn't really show well in the contrast. But yeah, now you can see a little bit more. You cast on this part here sideways. And then when you do your increases, you increase in a wedge shape, one wedge there, a second wedge here, and then a third wedge, and then it goes straight. So you really only have two knobs up here, and they're on your big toe, which is more durable than the rest of them. And I liked, this was a completely different heel as well. You did short rows to the midpoint, then you did a couple of stabilizing, and that keeps it from binding up in your ankle, because a lot of times a sock will crunch up there, and that stops that, and then short row until you're done. And just in comparison, this slipper pattern is a top down, and you can see how bulky it is here at the ankle when I'll pass it around, because you knit the heel flap, and then you pick up stitches and go sideways. So you actually knit around the corner, pick these up, and then do your decreases down, where on the other sock we did the decreases up. And when I pass these around, you'll see that the pick up and knit leaves a little rib there, and it's just annoying to me, which is why I like toe up. Any question about socks? Casting on is, is your starting point. You put your loops on. Usually when you're knitting in a straight line, you'll just put your loops and go, but it's trickier if you're doing a toe-up sock because you have to knit into both sides of the loop to avoid a seam. Any other questions? How long does it take to make a sock? This sock was worked on on and off at work, and it probably took about two months. <laughs> this Slipper is a much thicker yarn. It took three hours. So forever. That's why a lot of people don't knit socks anymore. <laughs> to contrast the, against the expert Thea, I've been working on a sock at Stitch and Bitch for three months, and it is this long. <laughs> I'm about to give up. Uh, second on our list, we have Tom, who's showing a robot. I'm Tom, the first time, so I'm nervous. This is, I've been working on this about 20 years, but it's really three projects, the one that failed, the one that sort of worked, and then the new one, which I'm 
the new stuff. Uh, let me just describe what I've got here right now. That's just one inch angled aluminum, two pieces, uh, quarter inch plywood wheel, milk bottle top, roller blade bearing, CD wheel cover. That's uh, uh, these are stepper motors. They sort of work, but not quite. These are lithium ion batteries, 14.8 uh, volts each. Pretty pricey. Casters, ball casters. The gears are just cheap plastic. And the wheels wobble. So, still not satisfied with it. So, um, the original project, different motors, different batteries. Let me show you those. had cataract surgery so I can't see anything these are let me see, those were the original batteries uh, nickel metal hydride didn't way too bulky this was an 8 bit 8 bit micro jackrabbit I don't know if any of you ever had any experience with that but they're they're they don't exist anymore that was I don't remember where the motors they didn't work they were way too weak uh, so I went to these motors these batteries and that's a Arduino AT Mega 2560 uh, the software was the software was uh, genuine Arduino code, and this is the motor driver. Um, These are uh, stepper motor controllers, surface mount, but you can see the messiness of it, not having a PC board. I tried to use power MOSFET transistors and for some reason didn't work. Uh, there's no reason why it wouldn't have, but I wanted to show this. I was in a robot club in Nashville called MTRAS, Middle Tennessee uh, Robotic Arts Society. I think they still exist. But they, they have their meetings there at uh, the Adventure Science Center. And so they have a cooperative, you know, they have their meetings there. And, but uh, they had an engineer's day where everybody was showing their stuff. So I wanted to get that done. And it, that's the one day this actually worked <laughs> in public. <laughs> So, but it, it, it uh, let me see what else. Yeah, this here is a, just an IR receiver, and I had just had a TV remote to operate it. But it, it did well. The kids liked it. Um, so, I say it almost worked that the motors would, if I try to run it too fast, it would just skip and just kind of hiccup. So I'm not satisfied. So now, Brushless DC motors. They're small, but 
uh, they'll run their 24 volt 18,000 RPM no load but they're geared down to 97 to 1 so I don't know don't know what to expect but if they don't work I'll just change them again <laughs> uh, Uh, so that is the never had these running yet um, but that's that's my objective This is all under construction, just never been powered up really. This is the motor controller for the BLDCs, um, not watered. It's got six MOSFETs, these aren't populated yet. A switch mode power supply for each motor. Uh, this is the controller board for the driver board. There's two, there's a micro for each motor, and um, did I do something? Oh, I keep hitting that, I guess. Sorry. Um, you're probably wondering why that's necessary. I, I can explain that, but I won't go into it now. And then finally, that, that's, those are just motors more or less devoted to, dedicated to the micros, to, to, dedicated to the motors. And then this is Rob's. He gave that to me. So that's an STM32 uh, micro that I uh, hope to use. I did it again. Are you just going to be a wire or a wireless? Um, ultimately, wireless. Um, I got several things to try there yet. I, I don't know uh, Bluetooth or some other technology. I don't think I'll do the IR. I, I want to at least across the room control it. Uh, I think anything else. Let me show you a, a diagram. This is a wooden stand that I use to prop up the, the wheels so they don't roll, but I can also work on it upside down, same. Questions? Are you going to use it for battling or what is the robot? No, I just, <coughs> I wanted to just let it explore and not run into anything. <laughs> um, it's not powerful enough to, um, you know, for AI or anything like that. Uh, maybe. I have a, a large robot I'll bring in sometime that uh, will be a full Linux system. This can't get there, but. Did you make the metal casting? Or yes. Just. 
Yeah, um, that's a long time ago, but I just did it on a bench vise and broke the first piece, but the second, third. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's a one eighth inch, inch thick, so I limited it to 45 degree angle bends. It worked okay. Anything else? That is incredibly impressive from scratch and everything. Doesn't work. <laughs> that's okay. It's still Not impressive. Yet. Not yet. That's the right answer. It doesn't work yet. Yeah, I like that too. I'm just oogling it. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll <laughs> put it out on a table or something. Sure. Thank you. Tom, you're going to put it out on the table or show it off after? Cool. Uh, next up, we have Jennifer showing off more sculpture. Try and put it under here. Okay, so it's sculpture in clay of two cephalopods or octopi. Um, let's see. Oh my! It's as far as it goes out. But if you can see, I've got legs on both of them. But, so they're still in progress. I've been working for about a month now, I guess. So, yes. Um, when you finish this and this kind of I'm researching that. I'm hoping someone experienced in sculpture may step forward and offer some assistance there. This is my first time with sculpting media, period. Um, I've never worked in clay before sculpting. I'm researching how to cast at this point. So latex casting, making a mold is typically the next step. Um, and then casting it, um, making a mold and then doing either resin or um, metal. Casting in metal is where you can go from here. I. I'm still trying to figure that out. So I would love someone. <laughs> if you know someone. <laughs> yes. So I see you freestyling it out here. Are mm -hmm. you just awesome at knowing how octopi look? Or are you using, like, are you looking at uh, it? They are very realistic. It's awesome. They look delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love cephalopods. I grew up in Florida around the ocean. Um, something in my brain is telling me this is what they look like. And to just that this is how it's supposed to look. So something in my brain is saying do this, put the clay here. So, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. That leads into my question. Yes. So you've been at it for a minute. I don't remember what uh, the kind of clay you said you're using. 
it's it's a plastilina it, or it's a plastic base um, it doesn't harden that's what I was wondering are you spraying it down and wrapping it no no it's it's reworkable um, it warms in your hand and softens um, if you heat it with a heat gun it literally melts so it is something that if you heat it it will melt um, so that's part of the casting sort of thing but I have no idea how that functions so <laughs> yeah it does so anything else no okay thank you Uh, next up on our list, we have Charlie and Margaret, who have made a chessboard. Ooh. Hello, my name is Charlie. Uh, this is my first time presenting. And as one of my first projects, I'm also a newer member, and I kind of came for the, the wood workshop. And so one of my first projects that I did was a chessboard, which was surprisingly easy to do as a beginner. Um, you know, I was looking at, looking at it like it was gonna be impossible. And it turns out it's real easy. You just cut a bunch of wood that looks the right color into the same size strips, and glue them together. And then once you do that, you're gonna cut them in the same size strips in the opposite way just like you see in this picture. That's a good word. That's a good piece. The sled is awesome. Um, oh, here. Yeah, so once you cut them on the same side, same size strips, you glue them together, make sure they're all straight, and you do the exact same thing, but you cut them into individual squares and you flip them around and then you got yourself a basic chessboard glue them together just like that and you have the basis obviously I have a border here as well um, this these two woods are like walnut and maple <laughs> Uh, I guess so. I'm not exactly sure if there's the different types of walnut. Uh, I got it from Brian. He just gave me some scraps. <laughs> I made something cool out of them. And actually, we got the maple as well from walnut initially. Or the maple as well from Brian. Um, he sold it to us for a great rate. Love that guy. Shout out to Brian. Yes. Um, this was a present from my brother because he plays chess. Uh, obviously, I will send it around. But after we've, um, after we glued it all together, you sand it down to make it flat, feels nice. You cut some pieces of wood for a nice border. And after that, I just used some min wax that was already in the shop and got a nice coat of it on it. And it's sealed and ready to go. It's pretty cool. Uh, I'll pass it around. You can feel it. It's a little dusty. It's been sitting in the workshop for a little bit, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we've for me. we've continued to say we were going to come in here and do this, but we finally brought it back and did it. Yeah. But um, also, Brian told us that we shouldn't glue these onto the sides because oh. it might expand and bust. So we're praying that that doesn't happen <laughs> because yeah. we did glue it together. Yeah. So one little thing that I thought I should mention is I'm I'm very new to woodworking. And something that Brian was kind of telling me is that I accidentally did it right, <laughs> where you want the grain patterns in the same direction, so you can see. You see these lines are going in the same direction. That's actually supposedly a good thing. I accidentally did it correctly, um, and that wood expands along the grain this way. So if the grain runs this way, it will expand that way. And so potentially over here, um, 
it might explode under the right uh, atmospheric conditions. Uh, hopefully it doesn't happen. I'm going to try and keep it stored indoors. Um, don't leave it in the garage. Yeah, don't leave it in the garage. Don't leave it. Leave it in a climate controlled area. Um, yeah, is there anything else that you can think of, Mom? Important details about this chessboard? No, I'm, I'm just going to say if you really don't know how to do things in the wood shop, then follow me around and you'll find out not how not to do things in the yeah. wood shop, generally speaking. But yeah, we uh, have a lot of fun. Uh, someone asked how thick it was. Uh, what do you think, Mom? Was it like three eighths? Yeah, at least. Three eighths inch, maybe? That's about right. I initially meant it for it to be a little bit thicker than this, but. When we glued it together, it wasn't super even, so we sanded it down, uh, down to its current width. And so now we have, instead of a half inch board, I have a, about three eighths. So. That's about right. Yeah. yeah. The sanding? Yeah, sanding. Just to use the hand sander. And after every time I sanded it, I just felt it, make sure it was flat. If it wasn't, just hit it again. Uh, yeah. Any other major questions? <laughs> I've got that question a few times. Uh, so I don't know anything about the lathe. I have uh, taken the mallet class with Brian where we do make our own handles on the lathe. So I have very minimal experience, but I think in the long term, that would be really cool to make my own pieces as well. Yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Long term. Any other, any other questions? All right. I'll pass it around. Very nice. Uh, that's all for our showing tonight. We have a couple of announcements. Our first one is from Joe. Sorry? Okay, okay. Sorry, Joe. True. Sorry. Hey, y'all. Sorry to keep y'all hanging out just a little bit longer. Um, I recently picked up a hammock on the cheap, and I've made a suspension for it. Um, they call it whoopee slings. And basically, it's an adjustable loop that has a built-in like Chinese finger trap design so you can adjust your hang of your hammock to the spacing of your trees what okay okay you might well there's not a whole lot to see there's the loop end here so if I pull the tag end, I can make that smaller. You can see that. It really just passes back through itself. So it really is like a Chinese finger trap. <laughs> um, and then I've also made some toggles uh, to go along with it. So you have a strap that goes around the tree and you could use a carabiner or you could tie a marlin spike hitch and put a toggle in there and this is just stainless steel tubing about eight millimeters uh, that hopefully will support me and uh, <laughs> gravity always wins it's heartless um, so anyway I cut these down on the lathe and smoothed them off and so you'll tie your knot on the tree and then the toggle goes around the knot and then you hook this over top of it and that's what connects this end to the tree so short and sweet if you have any questions feel free to hit me up or ask them now that's fine okay all kinds of questions This is uh, eighth inch Amsteel. Uh, it's one of those crazy synthetic materials that 
you can hold lots of weight with. Uh, you know, people use it uh, am steel rope for like winches and stuff. So I mean, you can pull your car out with it. It's pretty impressive stuff. Uh, any other questions? Did you braid it? Did you start with a thinner strand and then do the braiding to, to make that giant bigger? Uh, no. Um, so I didn't think to bring it. Uh, I used a fish tool. So it's a hollow core material and you can just separate the fibers. Uh, the fish tool that I use is basically a thin piece of wire that's just doubled over. And you can fish that up through the hollow core of the, of the rope and then fish the other end back through. And uh, there are some different knot elements uh, but it's, uh, so to like finish off the end, uh, on the tag end, trying to put everything up here. You kind of double the material back on itself. So you can see this last bit here is just a little bit thicker from here down where I've taken the fish tool up through the bottom, come out through the end, and then taken about four inches of material and drawn it back inside of itself and kind of smoothed the material back down to, so it's not really a knot, but it's a loop that's pulled almost completely through on itself. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Like, is that experimental? You came up with that? Or? No, this is a uh, tried and true method that is all over the internet. Uh, YouTube is my instructor's, <laughs> uh, is where I got my instruction for my uh, project here and I've done other I've done some other projects with Amsteel uh, in the past uh, for hammocking and camping and whatnot um, but this was my first attempt at whoopee slings and I'm pretty happy with how they turned out so all right anybody else all right finally warm enough to go camping and test that out. Uh, anyone else? Did I miss anybody else that has a show? Okay, Joe has an announcement. Hi. Um, we're having a um, micro club meeting on Thursday at 6, and what the micro club is is a group of people who are interested in microcontrollers like the Arduino, the Raspberry Pi, and the ESP32, also robotics, um, and any kind of, um, you know, microcomputer control. Uh, it was inspired by um, Isaac, first of all, uh, liked to come to classes and hang out, and he was saying that it would be nice to have a group of people that have had common interests like this to hang out. Mostly, it was inspired by Stitch and Bitch, um, which, uh, and then several other groups, I noticed, have also started the thing, where we're going to meet socially for about an hour and uh, just talk about, you know, that particular topic. So anyway, it's Thursday from 6 to 7. It'll be right here. And any questions? Yes? It's what? It is a meeting, and it is not a class. Yes. And uh, we, we're kind of restricting it to the microcontroller thing and not just uh, computers in general. So if uh, you, know, you have questions about computers in general or Linux or things like that, there would be other fora for that, hopefully. And there, okay, any more questions? Thank you. Uh, and one more announcement, uh, Aliki is right there, 
and she is volunteered to run our make sale this spring, summer-ish, the next make sale when we have it. She's looking for some help doing the easiest job researching the internet. So if anyone is interested in helping Aliki research the internet, uh, <laughs> the entire internet, uh, <laughs> Uh, I think she's looking for some local stuff, uh, not from around here for a, a super long time. So if you, anyone is interested in helping with that, it's a super easy uh, job to do. You can do it from the comfort of your own couch and you should talk to Aliki directly after this show and share or message her on Mattermost if you're not here tonight. So uh, those are the announcements. We have a couple classes coming up. Tonight is the new member onboarding directly after this. If you are a trial member, if you're interested in Knox Makers and becoming a member, if you've been a member and you just want to sit in here and listen to Isaac and I talk a little bit longer, that's cool too. Um, about five minutes after this gets out, we would, you can come and sit down and we'll do a little presentation. That is required for membership. Uh, if you can't make it to this one, there's another one on a Thursday coming up uh, in a couple weeks, but I don't remember the date off the top of my head. There are a lot of classes on our event calendar, which you can find at knoxmakers.org slash event. I'm only gonna talk about the ones that are not sold out. So on Saturday the 11th, we have Using, Choosing, and Abusing Transistors with Ray, who is talking about transistors, which I clearly need to go to that class because I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, Thursday the 16th, Billy just put up a Machining 100 class. That covers the zone. It's the authorization into the machining area. Friday the 17th is Learn to Draw. Uh, Susanna is teaching that class, and that will be, it's just a chill class. She said it's going to be meditative drawing. You're not going to be an expert at then, but it's going to be a good time. Um, Saturday is uh, Milling 101, so that is the authorization class for the Bridgeport Mill. Um, and then Saturday is also is Stitch and Bitch. And if you want a Linux group, you have to come up with like a fancy name that rivals Stitch and Bitch so that we can get and talk about computers. Um, that's cool. So also on the calendar is several embroidery machine classes. They sold out very quickly. It's a new machine that Sue is teaching everyone how to use. But if you're interested in it, you should talk to her. Um, she's only doing two people at a time. so. You can talk to her about uh, when it works for you or when, it, when she's going to put new classes up. I think she's still trying to gather interest on that. Um, so those are all the classes coming up in the next two weeks. Like I said, there's a lot more, but they are sold out or they're farther out in the calendar. Um, if I could get a volunteer to empty the trash tonight. Somebody? Yes? Okay. Uh, and that's all I've got. So if you're here for... Uh, new member onboarding, stick around, move closer, and if you're not, then go have fun in the shop. <laughs>